It would appear uh, to, that I'm going to talk about water tonight, and I was, my talk is really about the lack of water in WA, to some, in, well, in particularly in Perth, to some degree, and then I'll walk here from the car tonight and nearly get drowned. So perhaps we should have these presentations more often and we might solve some of our problems. But I've been asked to talk about water sustainability. And water sustainability is a very large subject. Water sustainability should be a fundamental focus for us all due to its impact on the economy, on the environment, and the livability of our cities. The amount of water on our planet remains constant. The amount of fresh, usable water is only a small fraction of that water, and access to, access to it is problematic. We should zealously protect what we have and manage it carefully. The subject, it is a subject that is independent of climate, but is often influenced by it. So fundamentally, we've got the amount of water we're always going to be playing with. The question is, where is it and how can we access it? Tonight I'm going to focus on the history of domestic water supply for Perth, which has been very much influenced by climate and not the climate we have outside us today. So let's just have a look at the history of stream flow over about the last 120 years. You see in the period up to the mid-1970s, was reasonably consistent and we had very good stream flow into our dams. That subsequently dropped off from those 70s going through those various drop-off periods to the period 2015 where in fact we had negative inflow or sorry negative uh, input into our dams. We had something like 11 gigalitres of inflow and about 14 gigalitres of evaporation in that particular year. Now, one of my predecessors, as, or one of my CEO's predecessors, used to take that graph and then drew the line of best fit through the various downgrades and said, we're gonna hit zero inflow, and in fact, we have. How consistent that will be, how long it will be, will be a question that will be looked at in the future. But very much a continuing downgrade in the amount of water we have available to us for naturally occurring rainfall in WA. If I look at the history of our uh, water supply, and we talked in the previous slide about the amount of stream flow. And stream flow and rainfall are not a direct correlation. I want to stress that because you might notice even this year we had quite a bit of summer rain. Summer rain produces effectively no inflow into the dams. So you can have two years with exactly the same amount of rainfall and almost 100% different input into your dams. And that's something that we've had to deal with. This, this particular chart is looking at just the sequence of what we've had to do with an increasing population growth and how we've been supplying water with that reduction. The, uh, the um, yellow line is the same graph as the previous one just a different determination. We then have the population growth overlaid it. We're now going to look at the sources of water in our total water supply requirements. First of all, the dams, followed by groundwater, and then subsequently desalination. Now up to the mid-1970s, and as was said earlier, I started in the Water Corp in 1970, Everything that came into Perth water supply was from the dams. There's about nine dams up in the hills. They've in fact got sufficient capacity for two years total demand out of Perth if they were full. I have to say they've never been full, nor have they been anywhere near full. But if they were, were full, there's about 600 gigalitres capacity and we use roughly 300 gigalitres a year. So up to the 1970s, early 1970s, it was all dams supply. So 1958 was 52% and only a small portion of groundwater. And that portion of groundwater was a couple of artesian bores, deep artesian bores. And then in the 70s and 80s, we started to take groundwater 
from the shallow aquifers north of the river as the population developed north of the river. But that really had nothing to do with climate change, it was just the cost of getting dam water north of the river, it was better to take the groundwater which we then had worked out was there and available to us. As we went on, by 1980, climate change was starting to impact on us and the change of influence was that we had 65% of our water from dams and 35% from groundwater. Okay, we're still getting a fairly good input from the dams at that particular point in time. By 2004, the impact of climate change was such that we had gone and that the, uh, the distribution had swapped over, so it was only 38% from dams to 62% from groundwater, so becoming very much more reliant on groundwater. And at that point in time, groundwater was seen to be a much more sustainable source of water. Now clearly as time goes on, with the lack or the reduction in rainfall, groundwater is eventually going to be impacted. But there are three layers of groundwater we take, shallow groundwater, um, which is the superficial aquifer, and then two layers of confined groundwater and deeper aquifers with very old water in them and quite large volumes. Then by 2016, it had got to the stage that there was basically no inflow into the dams, as I explained earlier. So our water supply distribution now comes from, and we've introduced desalinated water, seawater desalination in two plants, one at Quinana and one down at um, Binning Up. And in each case, we built one of those dam, one desalination plant with the expectation it would be five to ten years before we built the next one. We almost, the day we finished, we started building the next, which was a half size. Again, on the basis it would be five or ten years before we had to build the second half of that, and we're straight into the second half of that. But basically what it means is a lot of our water supply is now coming from uh, manufactured sources of water. A huge change in the way we've had to use water. So one of the methods of using climate change is looking at new sources of water. That's what the picture is in that up to date. A second part of the option for how we're going to handle climate change and water sustainability in the state is in, around Perth is reuse. Much work has been done on this and of course it's a very popular and populous commentary that reuse is something we should do a, a lot across the metropolitan area. We continue to do a lot of, of work on it but Perth is quite unique in that it's a city that sits directly on high quality groundwater that is recharged with a storm event, so stormwater runoff, and we talk a lot, you'll hear a lot about stormwater capture. We capture probably about 75 to 80% of the stormwater directly into our sand aquifers before it leaches and goes into the rivers at some point later date. Reuse therefore requires very high levels of treatment to protect groundwater sources, which in most cases leads that to being uneconomical. The reuse of our, from our wastewater treatment plants is starting to occur. <coughs> We've just completed the first of our groundwater replenishment plants in, at Binyup, and the second half of that is being considered at the moment. So it's a 14 gigalitre plant there currently. There's a further 14 gigalitres potentially on the site which will start to go into construction in the near future. And there's also an industrial reuse plant down at Quinana. now. Those three combined take a lot of pressure off the existing potable sources, but they also provide a lot of environmental benefit, particularly with the groundwater replenishment in the Binyup area. So reuse is happening, but it's happening at a municipal scale rather than at a subdivisional scale. And one of the detrimental issues, not detrimental so much, but one of the difficult issues for the subdivisional scale is the economics of um, the large scale schemes in water supply and make it very difficult to compete in a cost sense, particularly when you've got to consider the amount of um, treatment that's got to go into it. So I'm rushing through a bit of this because we've got a seven minute time zone and people are putting their, oh, it's throat cutting. <laughs> the other major component of this is demand management. 
And from that graph, you'll note that while the population is increased, same population increase we saw before, the per capita demand has, in fact, reduced by about 60% in that period. People would still argue that that demand, per capita demand, is very high compared to other cities in Australia, and that is absolutely correct. However, again, Perth, because of its particular climatic environments where we get no rain through the summer effectively and very hungry, sandy soils, while we remain with reasonable sized blocks and outside watering, the likelihood is we're going to have higher per capita water use than many of the more densely populated other, other capitals. Where, is that, where has that demand come from? Well, largely it's come from things that are now hardwired into the system. And I think that I'm very consciously putting that up on the basis that they are hard, hardwired into the system because we've had a lot of cooperation from the community, but that co co community cooperation is fairly dependent on the amount of times you are talking to the community. So the two-day-a-week sprinkler roster, which was introduced, anybody know when? 2001, 2002. Um, the two-day-a-week sprinkler roster has been highly successful in, in reducing demand. The winter sprinkler ban, which we're in the middle of, although a good deal of the population don't seem to know that still. Um, <laughs> is being a contributor and a whole series of other things, pricing impacts and other activities there. And again, happy to take questions on that a bit further later. But the other, and I guess my final point in this is, how do we bring the community along in that journey? Because demand management is so important to it. It is continually interacting with our community. The message has to be continually reinforced, and that's just a graph of all of the reinforcements that have gone with the various publicity campaigns, the, the various brandings that have happened over the years um, to ensure that the communi community remain focused. We would love to think, community all understand where we want to go, and they're all on board, and they're all doing the right things, but very clearly, all of the research we've ever done suggests that we have to continue that focus. Thank you very much. What are our challenges for the 21st century? We're already in it. What are the challenges we want to face as we go through that? As I'm sure most of you are aware, current population is expected to exceed 9 billion by 2050. Now, that's not that far away. Um, and you can see from the graph there how much the um, population is actually increasing. So we currently sit somewhere around here. So we've actually passed the 9 billion mark. Um, and one thing to note from that is China is currently the population, has the biggest population worldwide in terms of countries, but India is predicted to overtake that and become the most populous country um, by 2024. That graph says 2030, but a recent report from the United Nations has actually put that at 2024. Um, so, and if you add the two countries together, China and India combined make up 37% of the total global population. So they are a huge component of the population. So when we're looking at things like agricultural sustainability, we can't just look at ourselves within Australia. We have to look at it on a global scale. Um, China and India don't have the land available to feed themselves. Although um, China has a policy to be self-sufficient by 2025, it includes a lot of initiatives that are global initiatives rather than just within China itself. The other challenge, or the next challenge for the 21st century, is that the big economies of China, India, and Brazil are still currently growing, their incomes are growing, and therefore their demand for high protein food is increasing. In 1992, China overtook the US as the country that consumes the most um, meat on a worldwide scale, okay? Three quarters of that meat is pork. That's their preferred meat. 
um, and their next most popular meat would be um, chicken. Okay? However, what you need to remember when you, about that is that although China consumes the most meat worldwide, they don't consume the most per capita. And when you look on a per person basis, there's actually um, about... <laughs> China's right down the bottom there. So there's more than a dozen countries that actually consume significantly more meat per person than China does, with Australia right at the top, not something I think that's necessarily need to be very proud of, but is something that's very much the Australian history, um, consuming more than double the amount per year that a per person would do in China. So the third challenge for the 21st century is that we need to increase global food supply by about double in the, well, in the next 50 years. So that's a significant challenge that worldwide we need to actually face. So to combine those all together, the challenge for the 21st century for the 1.8 billion people who currently grow our food is that they need to double food output using less water. Um, we've already had a talk on declining water in Perth, but worldwide it's declining because of pollution, salinisation um, and other competing uses with less land. Um, through land degradation and urbanisation spread, so we're actually using our best agricultural land. Less energy, you will have heard in the news about peak, peak energy having been reached, that peak oil has been reached. Um, transport and fertiliser both need that resource as part of um, an agricultural production system. And we need to do that with a changing and a more risky climate. The question for today is can we achieve that sustainably? Is it possible to achieve that sustainably? Now, when you think about agricultural sustainability, some of the things that people tend to think about straight away is your organic farming or your regenerative farming, where you're not putting any chemicals on the land. It is farmed very sustainably. Um, regenerative farming is not taking anything away that you're not actually putting back into the land. The problem with those two sources is that we can't feed the predicted global population using those methods alone. So we need to be able to farm sustainably using less resources, without degrading the soil, with an increasingly variable climate, but we also have to maintain farm incomes and livelihoods. Farmers are no different to any other industry worldwide that they can't afford to be sustainable unless they're profitable. If they're not profitable, then they're going to go out of business and then the farm won't be sustainable because it will have become very over-degraded. So the farm also has to be profitable. And it's balancing those two, which is another part of the challenge. Now, that's the part of my doom and gloom part of the talk. How can we actually achieve this? What are some of the things that are currently happening um, around the world and here in Western Australia where we're actually one of the leaders in agricultural innovation. We're one of the leaders in performing um, or achieving yields using much lower fertilisers, using a lot less inputs in a much drier climate than many other parts of the world achieve. So how are we actually doing that? Is it going to enable us to achieve a sustainable agriculture into the future? So I'm just now going to give you a snapshot of some of the things that are happening. I don't have time to go into great detail about them. It's something I could probably talk to you for about... Well, I, I teach a whole unit on it, so five hours times 12, so an awful lot of time. <laughs> so just a few snapshots here. Um, first one, something that you hear about a lot in the news, utilising new different technologies. Big data is the new age for this um, decade at the moment. So we've got things like no-till. No-till farming is um, a method where we actually eliminate soil erosion because you've got ground cover there all the time. It's where the farmer no longer ploughs the soil, but actually keeps his stubble from one year to the next and ploughs the next crop directly into that paddock, retaining the stubble from the previous year. So having that stubble there allows him to, one, get rid of soil erosion. It slows down water use, so you don't get as much soil movement um, that way as well. It enables you to increase soil quality and build up, therefore build up your organic matter. 
And a plus side for the farmer, it also allows him to increase yields. This is mainly because he's able to sow the crop much earlier into the season. He doesn't have to go through successive cycles of um, ploughing the land to manage his weeds before he actually sows the crop. And because of having the stubble maintained in the system, he actually gets a much lower evaporation from the soil surface, and so he's able to increase the water holding capacity of the soil and gets a much more efficient use of the water that's actually there. Um, the second one is controlled traffic farming. Farming using the big machinery that is typically used on farms today is very heavy, and so driving that machinery over the farm compacts the soil, which means that the plant roots can't grow down into the soil, um, doesn't allow the water to penetrate the soil, and so actually leads to reducing yields. By using controlled traffic farming, the farmer actually has all his machinery running on exactly the same um, tram lines, so that he accepts that where those tram lines are, he's not going to get efficient yields, because that soil does get compacted. But only about 15% of a paddock ends up being compacted, whereas if he doesn't follow tram lining, he can end up with to up towards 50% of the paddock in any one year being driven over at least once, and therefore compacting the soil. In between those areas where he doesn't have any traffic, the soil isn't compacted, it becomes much more open, you've got much more opportunity for soil and water penetration and for soil microbes and things like that to persist on a year-to-year -year basis, and crop yields also significantly increase because they're not trying to deal with a grow through a compacted soil profile. Other um, new technologies are precision agriculture. This is where, um, using um, a range of different methodologies, we're able to actually develop a very clear picture of a whole range of different profiles of a paddock or across a whole farm. So this can be range from things like salinity, it can range from nitrogen levels, potassium um, levels, any other nutrients that we need. It can look at areas where the water, um, where the water holding sort of ability of the soil is, which areas are compacted. And all of that can be put together into a map which you can overlay with your farm yields. And then you can look to see which areas of your farm are producing well each year and which areas aren't. Those areas that aren't giving you an economic production from, you can look to see why. And then it gives you the opportunity to either focus on those areas and to hopefully rehabilitate them and bring them back into the system or to make the decision that actually they've never been profitable they're never going to be profitable, and by continually farming them, I'm actually making them worse, and I'm better off to, to fence them off and to let them revegetate naturally and to actually take them out of the farming system. So precision agriculture is just one of a whole suite of different method, methods that allow you to bring that, that map together and give you a very good understanding of your farm um, on a paddock-by-paddock paddock basis and how it actually, how it actually performs. Other technologies that we've, um, not technologies, other um, methods that we can use to increase agricultural sustainability, which I've sort of broadly termed increasing soil health. Soil health is such an important component of agricultural sustainability that if we don't have good soil health, we're never going to have sustainable agriculture. So I've got two pictures here. Um, oops, oh, I don't know what's happened to my, my presentation's lost its little. Um, things that tell you what they are. The first photo there um, is of fodder shrubs, which are native bushes that grow naturally in the rangelands, would have grown in the wheat belt, that are now being grown in low-lying parts of the farmland that have either been badly degraded through salinisation, through water um, sort of runoff, or on tops of slopes where you're getting problems with... Um, wind blow and things. So it's really helping to stabilise the soil. And you can see in that picture on the left that not only have you got your fodder shrubs, which are these more grey bushes, that also provide very good feed for sheep, but you've also, in a good year like last year, end up with a significant amount of feed underneath because it's stabilised the whole soil. It's used the water, driven down the water table so that the salinity becomes less of an issue. Um, and then you start to get 
this undergrowth comes back as well. So it's really helping to rehabilitate the soil, but it's also providing the farmer with a um, very good feed resource for his sheep as well. The next one is increasing soil microbes. There's various ways of doing this. The picture here shows you um, one of the pasture species that's grown in the wheat belt that is a legume, and so it grows nodules which um, produce nitrogen, which is then left for the following year, um, enabling you to reduce your fertiliser yield um, input the following year because the legumes actually need leave enough there for you to use. It all, but there's also other, lots of different other soil microbes that farmers are incorporating in with their seeding programme to actually start to build up the soil health and finding that by increasing their soil health, it actually enables, they actually find that they get less plant disease and there's actually less requirement for them to use other chemicals as part of their farming system. Um, the next picture is a very nice picture of canola. Um, but the reason I've put it up there is just one of the important things of improving sustainability is to make sure you have good rotations. Um, WA is quite reliant on our wheat and our canola as our main crops that we produce, but there's a whole suite of other rotational crops that we can use that are very important to enable us to, to build up the soil health, to, for a no-till farming system to work pro um, properly, but also to reduce things like um, your diseases and your weed carryover and things like that. The final picture I want to show you is um, ways of increasing soil health is to actually manage chemical use. Um, when chemicals came in, whether they be fertilisers, fungicides, pesticides, um, whatever, it, they're a very easy way of farming, um, of controlling your weeds, of controlling your diseases. But we're actually finding now that they're not necessarily, it's not all good. They do make control, you control the disease, but they have carry-on effects in following years. And the picture there is showing you a wheat plant that's been sown into a paddock that was sown with chemicals not at the right time and that the chemicals haven't actually broken down. And that wheat plant won't survive very long with a root system like that. So the final slide um, I want to show you is how the Centre for Crop and Disease Management fits into sustainable agriculture. Um, it's a centre that's focusing on how we manage diseases and how it, the sustainability fits in because if we can manage our diseases by developing new crop varieties, by um, managing the system better so we can reduce our chemical inputs, then it all builds, it enables us to, to reduce the risk of fungicide resistance so those chemicals last longer, but it also enables us to farm more sustainably. Thank you. Yes, I left in 89 as, uh, from the business school, business law and accounting from Curtin, and it was a fan as an alumni, it was a fantastic uh, place to have studied, and it set a great platform for me. Um, so I followed the traditional pathway of, of accounting business law into commerce, but bounced between investment um, and, uh, you know, sort of straight finance, etc. but then drifted into technology commercialisation. So my career in, ended up sort of bouncing between business, pure business, finance, investment, and then more latterly, right into that commercialisation side. So um, being a non-academic, um, you know, I'm not an expert, but what I'd like to offer up is um, what transpired probably over the last eight years of my life, backing uh, myself and a few others into ventures, which are entirely about commercialisation of technology, but specifically in the domain of sustainability. And a lot of this sort of came about after doing a little stint as the CEO of Greening Australia, um, which is a national NGO in landscape scale restoration. And those three um, most recently are biogas renewables um, around bioenergy, clean, clean, tech, clean tech energy, which is a, uh, a West Australian retail company, a small West Australian uh, electricity retailer, um, but focused entirely on, um, on green, in, um, green uh, delivery of generation and matching that with demand, so a renewable power into the West Australian grid, and shark mitigation systems, which is all about um, identifying science-led technologies to mitigate the risk of shark attack in a way that's sustainable. So I'll start with the sharks because it's the thing that seems to excite people and I guess the, the negative on that is that it, it is quite, um, it's quite divisive, it's quite an emotional issue and that, that image um, I find and, and you would read in the West Australian it has become highly political and highly infused with emotion. Um, the thing is that um, you know, the risk of shark attack is, is extremely low 
but its impact on the community is very profound um, because of our emotional state about it. And there is a high level of demand and a high level of concern in a government community and, and now, as a result, at a business level, try and find solutions to this. And the good thing from a West Australian perspective, it, we think of it as a particularly West Australian problem, but it's not. Um, the the, 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 the um, manifestation of this seemed to have begun in Western Australia about the increase in shark attacks, but then the East Coast had the same issue. Uh, Japan, Hawaii, Reunion Island, and now the East and, and West Coast of the United States are starting to have a problem with this. Um, so um, what we, and, and the difficulty with building technologies around this in a, in a, in a confused state where there's so much uh, discussion is that it's hard to get the science out and be science-led on this. But one of the things that we put together with shark mitigation systems is the Clever Boy. And the Clever Boy is a technology which basically uses sonar to um, uh, project it off a beach or from the sea floor to create a virtual perimeter around the beach. And essentially what the Clever Boy is looking for is um, a self-propelled object that uh, is of a certain size that can be defined that swims like a shark. So the idea is essentially that it's face recognition software for sharks, if you like. And the way this came out was in, uh, they were using a tech like this for identifying um, or picking up seals that might get into the subsea turbines in the North Sea up in, in Scotland. So what we did is took that and repurposed that, plonked it in the shark tank, shark tank at Sydney Aquarium and just let it capture hundreds and hundreds of signatures of sharks and then essentially taught the system to be able to, um, to, be able to detect sharks. And the complexity in that is that might seem quite simple, but then the trick is to actually productise, commercialise that in such a way that it'll meet a price point, it'll, it'll be competitive with the other ways of mitigating shark attack, netting, et cetera, as, as, as problematic as that might be environmentally. And, uh, and, and, and the, the energy and effort that goes into that is quite, quite extreme. I just thought I would show you, um, for interest really more than anything, um, this is a white shark, uh, about a four metre, uh, sorry, a four metre tiger shark that's uh, just swimming through. And if I can just ask you to boot that up for us. So this is what the sonar is actually seeing. And from the right-hand side, you'll see the entry of a, of, a, um, of a tiger shark. Now, the thing is, so it's boxing it up like Top Gun. So what it's basically doing is saying, is it self-propelled? Yes. Is it of a certain size? Yes. So I'm going to allocate it a higher score. Is it swimming like a shark? Yes. I'll give it a tick of 99%. And then the clever boy goes, right, we'll send a, a notice to the lifeguard to tell the lifeguard wh where that shark actually is. And the thing about a shark is that it... it swims differently to anything else that's in the sea. So it is possible to get that detection sorted out, contrary to what the West Australian uh, might say. Um, so anyway, the, the upshot of that is we, uh, we, we tested that at the Abrolis with some sharks up there. We tested it down in Esperance with some white sharks. We took it to Bondi and we did a trial for a couple of months at Bondi Beach. And the Bondi lifeguards did a, made a big fuss of it and they, um, they did a you know, even did a show on it actually, and, and one of the guys actually put a fin on his back and tried to trick it and do all the kind of stuff that you'd expect <laughs> from Bondi Rescue. Um, but we also were asked to, we were also asked to deploy a clever boy at um, J Bay the year after Mick Fanning was um, was um, kind of buzzed, and uh, and uh, we didn't have any sharks that year, but we don't have one at J Bay just at the moment, which is going on. And of course, there was a shark just overnight. Um, but the World Surfing League didn't really want to talk about sharks uh, and so we were kind of on a non-disclosure for that at the time and then we made a deployment here um, on, at City Beach so there were two clever boys and an array of sonars off City Beach through the summer this year and there are about 34 uh, detections over about four months roughly. Now um, uh, not all of those would have been sharks but a, f a good number based on the statistics we're getting and the response we're getting from that system a good number probably would have been and it's not something that which Australia really wants to talk about. So the next one is, um, is biogas renewables. And, and just very, very briefly, I want to articulate um, um, an innovation that's happened here in Western Australia around um, building a 2.4 megawatt uh, uh, generation plant using 35 to 50,000 tonnes of food waste, which is located out at Rich Grow Garden Products. So Rich Grow, if you go to Bunnings, you, you'll be familiar with. They had, they've got about 100 acres near the airport out there, and they were sort of, I guess, getting a bit commoditised in their business. They had a big, um, a big uh, power bill. Um, and so the idea here, and we've had this commission for a couple of years, is to collect commercial industrial waste streams, so not the stuff that comes out of our bins, 
which is at the, probably the harder end of source separation, but the stuff that comes from Ingham's Chicken and the brewery, Gage Roads and all those sort of places, put that all into a digester. It's essentially a big mechanical gut um, where you heat it, you stir it, you macerate it, and you let the natural process come off. The methanogen bugs um, in an anaerobic environment will produce methane, run the methane through a, a generator, and you can get some really high quantities of, of product through that. So that's basically taken rich go off the grid and it's um, exporting um, around about 1.5 meg, depending on the time of the day, into the system here in Western Australia. Now that's the second one in Australia and the, the east is, is, we're getting lots and lots of visitors from the east now um, for proponents to be building plants around in the eastern states as well. So it's a tick in the box for innovation for Western Australia and I should say, in relation also to shark mitigation systems and shark mitigation technology generally, Western Australia has become quite a hub for this. Um, so Shark Shield, um, uh, ourselves, the Oceans Institute um, and the, uh, the Indian Ocean Marine Science Research Centre are all got a strong focus on sharks and we're really leading the way on that front. Sorry, just let me flip through that. So uh, this is just some images at some food waste, um, uh, some chicken waste turning up from an abattoir, uh, Smith's Crisp going into a bunker, uh, even out of date uh, 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 pet bottles and soft drink, etc. And, um, you know, we do the testing for the biomethane potential of just about everything that you would ordinarily eat. And it, it is very similar to eating what goes into your body. So more carbs, more, more energy. And um, soft drink gives up everything that it's got from an energy perspective in seven hours. And bread sometimes takes up 20 days. So you can imagine what happens when you put that stuff in your kid. <laughs> so... As a result of it, so just a couple of case examples, probably to put a bit of flavour into the idea of commercialisation around sustainability. But now, um, just three observations that I'd like to offer up before we go to, to um, the subsequent panel conversation. And that is, I think, in this journey, I've, I've, had, I've had some reasonably close touch points with the university sector and the academic sector and around commercialisation, because the universities think of themselves and, and are, to a great degree, innovators, but not a great deal of that penetrates into the real world. And in part, that's because, um, you know, the level of investment and the high level of risk for a venture to take something, commercialise it, and go through what they call a valley of death in the commercialisation cycle is, is very high. And so the certainty needs to be fairly high as well. But I think there's something else. Well, that's what the, the valley of death kind of looks like. But I've, sort of come, to, sort of come to the view that there's a, there's a dissonance between what academia is doing and what commercialisation and, 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 um, and the uh, commercialisation world and investment actually needs. And it's, it's almost a cultural legacy from the way universities were built 150, 200 years ago. But fundamentally, you know, the currency of academia is the paper. And, you know, the, PH, the, the paper is what defines the PhD to get their job. Once they've got the job, they've got to stay alive in the university system. So it's all about publications again to get the H index up so they can attract more funding in a, in a very, very competitive grant funding world. And a lot of the academics I've experienced, and I may be wrong, are spending at least half their time writing deals and the other half of the time doing the research, almost like a small business, you know, almost like a small businessman. Um, and then if you're going to go anywhere in research, you need to build a research team, academic fame. That's what the driver is for these guys. But the academic paper is almost, almost useless for, I mean, except from a... From a, from a well, if, if, if industry can find it, it's very hard to capitalise on it because, of course, there's no proprietorship around it. The whole idea of the fact that it's already been published mitigates its opportunity to actually uh, capture novelty and, and get some kind of protectable IP around it. So what I've sort of articulated here is a lot of individual um, small to medium enterprise guys in academia building out their world, producing papers. Industry can't latch onto the paper so what the university does is it builds an office of commercialisation. It, it, it builds a mouthpiece that can be the go-between. But the problem is that the academics often, in my experience, uh, are leery of the office of commercialisation because they're worried about losing something that might uh, attach to them in their career and having it uh, kind of diluted in the big wide world or, or shared in such a way that the commercialisation value doesn't accrue to them. So. Um, it's not a really clear... Uh, what I've done up the top there is just basically taken the... Um, I, I used University of WA, not Curtin, for the intellectual property regulations, since we're at Curtin. But 
Uh, at the top there is basically um, a very, very broad brush version of, of who owns the IP and the different context of the different players inside that university. And I just, I feel that if we could link up the university's interests, the academics' interests, and I'm, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking their commercial interests and the opportunities that flow from the IP that they build and what industry needs, I think we're going to have a much more successful commercialisation model, even if that means that the value in all that chain is, is much more broadly shared. And if you took the view, I guess, you know, like, like the spawning fish, you spawn lots and lots of these things on a portfolio basis. Some of them are going to go gangbusters and most of them are going to fail. But if you made it very, very simple to put ventures together, get the academic lined up so they're getting some value out of it, get some money into it and get it moving, I think the success rate would be a lot higher. Second observation is, um, as we get more and more uh, specific and specialised in society and in, in what we do in terms of research, the more that we've got to observe cross-discipline. You know, I, I, you, 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 um, academics and disciplines and research generally tends to dive down the rabbit hole, but the greatest uh, breakthroughs in research generally come where there's the coming together of cross-discipline. And, you know, um, it's not a great analogy, but at a time when things were a lot simple, Leonardo da Vinci had the, all those skills kind of built, all those multidisciplinary skills built into one man, you know, an engineer, um, a, a, someone who is capable in medicine, an artist. Now, the manifestation of all that in one brain gave rise to some massive innovation, and the same thing is true if we can connect better uh, the different disciplines inside the uh, research centres and inside uh, industry indeed. And the last one, um, and I guess I'm harking back to, to, to biogas and, and what I've seen, but, you know, when I was at Greening Australia, um, you know, part of my interest in Greening Australia was that it was, uh, I wanted to see how we could um, productively develop um, commercial crops which also sequestered carbon so that we could have a sustainable model. You know, grants are never going to subsidise land care um, and, uh, and sort of restoration of landscapes, but productive farming systems that sequestered carbon will potentially do that. So that, that was the interest. And the difficulty was trying to take Greening Australia into that whole carbon domain is since, when was that? 10 years ago, the, West, the Australian government has been bouncing in its, uh, in its regulations, its incentives, its subsidies around uh, the internalisation of the cost of carbon, basically. And investment just can't get around it. It's impossible, you know. So I, for my own part, even, even as an NGO, we, were, we, were probably, we probably did quite a lot of money trying to work out how to participate in this and have the rules changed. And I think what's happened, though, and I, I, I'm leading a little bit with Tony Sieber, whom many of you, will, I'm sure, have seen. He's been um, prominent in the last couple of weeks, four or five weeks, really, on, on social media, lecture and entrepreneurship at Stanford. But to my mind and in my experience now, what's happening is we're past the pivot point. We're past the point where... Um, where regulation subsidy uh, by government is going to really uh, be important. It's already gathering momentum. It's not going to be one technology. I mean, PV is getting pushed strongly in the convergence with battery and the convergence with transport and so forth. It'll be a, it'll be a portfolio approach of different technologies, but renewable technologies are stacking up in their own right. PV, um, uh, it does now in Western Australia, even to grid. Um, the anaerobic digestion plants that I... I uh, showed you uh, probably a sub five year payback without subsidy, without grant. So um, I feel as though we've, we've definitely reached the pivot point and I suspect what's going to happen now with five prime ministers and a, and, a, and a bouncing government and continuing to bounce, almost become antagonistic to renewables again, um, industry will just go on and, and, and um, you know, whatever rules get set as long as they're not uh, undermining and, le and keep a level playing field for renewables we will see renewables take their natural place in the commercial pathway for energy. And that's it. Cheers. So, yeah, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of uh, electronic waste recycling in WA. Um, it's a yeah, company that started with my brother eight years ago uh, while still um, studying at Curtin. So <laughs> it was quite fun doing in second year engineering. Um, so basically, everyone would be familiar with this sort of way of thinking. You buy, you walk past your favourite shop, you see a new thing and, and you think to yourself, well, everyone has one of these things, I really need to get one of these things. 
It's going to change my life. Really, I should buy it now. And unfortunately, this way of thinking leads to um, some pretty devastating environmental damage. Um, just that cycle of consumerism, all that product that's used either goes back into landfill or winds up hopefully not somewhere like this. Um, so yeah, needless to say, this way of thinking generates a lot of uh, waste. So in 2014-15 uh, financial year, it's estimated that a total of 121,000 tons, 121, tons of televisions and computers reached end of life in Australia, um, which to put it in perspective, is approximately 15,000 40-foot sea containers. Um, we get around about eight tonne in a 40-foot sea container that gets delivered to us. And that's roughly four full medium-sized um, container ships full of e-waste that's getting thrown out every year. So that's all got to go somewhere. So where does it go when we throw it out? Chances are they'll end up with a recycling company like ours or in landfill, or being exported overseas. Um, so that's where you should really send it, send it down to us. <laughs> so just give you a bit of background on what we're doing about it. We've set up a um, recycling company in WA where we've got a manual and mechatronic or mechanised uh, recycling process, uh, and it's important to have both with the way that technology is at the moment. Um, basically, we've got the, the manual part where we remove all the hazards that our technology can't handle yet. As uh, technology gets cheaper and better, we'll be able to handle that a lot um, better with the introduction of AI and things like that. Um, but basically, we remove all the hazards manually. And once we've re removed all the hazards, like leaded glass, um, mercury back lamps, uh, batteries, ink and toner cartridges. There's quite a lot of nasties in electronic waste. Then it goes through our recycling plant, which me, my brother and my dad set up over a couple of months, which was um, good fun. That went in last year. It's um, got 10,000 tonnes per annum capacity. Um, it's modular and it's adaptable, so we can strap on new technology as it becomes available. We're looking to add a few colour sorters and, and um, different separation technologies as we go. But basically from this plant, we're able to um, pull off a sort of clean or relatively clean steel that can be put back into um, steel production. They've got the electric motors and transformers there where we get the copper and silicon steel out because there's quite, there's you know, maybe 100 to 200 different materials that's locked up inside of this e-waste that's lost if it's not treated carefully. Um, from there, it goes over our, just a basic picking line where we pull out things like uh, focus materials. There's about 30 different things we pull out, but I couldn't fit uh, 30 pictures up here. Um, but basically, you've got your PVC copper wire. We've got copper aluminium um, heat sinks and aluminium uh, heat sinks. Uh, main one, circuit boards, which contains a lot of your precious metals, like your gold and your silver and palladium, platinum, things like that, um, which we send off to a precious metal refiner, and they get all those things out. Um, then it goes over our eddy current separator, which pulls out the remaining ferrous material and um, non-ferrous metals that were sort of not broken up enough from the first shredding process. Um, and we get a zorber mix, which has got your circuit boards, your aluminium and your copper, and um, a plastic fraction, <clears throat> which is quite a complex waste stream in itself. And if we run that back through, then uh, we can pull out those circuit boards as well. So we've got like an aluminium copper mix and circuit boards, which can be sent off to other recyclers around the world where one COG in a very big global um, supply chain um, and we specialise in the front end and then we send that to people who specialise in the back end. We can't do it all in-house because some of the things that, like a circuit board refinery, people have spent billions of dollars on that technology. It's something that we can't compete on yet. Um, just to give you a, an idea of all the different things I tried to... Um, 
categorise everything into these things. There's a lot more that we actually do pull out, but here's the basics of what we get. We get all the ferrous material, plastic, you can see is 16% shredded and 7% um, baled. Um, we get out leaded glass, non-leaded glass. Um, we get the mercury back lamps out of the uh, LCD screens. Um, even ethylene glycol oil, which is in your uh, rear projection tellies, is a coolant. So there's quite a lot of stuff that we can recover. 95% or 94% going off this graph is what we recover and send to other recyclers to be turned into new products. Um, so the scale of the problem in WA, every day we receive two full uh, sea containers full of electronic waste and last year we recycled over 250,000 devices. Um, and unfortunately we only get around 30% of what's being thrown, thrown out um, with the remainder still being exported or landfilled. Um, <clears throat> and we recognise that recycling is only part of the solution. Like, you, you cannot recycle our way out of plastic pollution. It's a simple thing, just recycling it doesn't make it uh, environmentally friendly, but it's an essential step in the sustainable process. So we've got our reuse um, division where we try and get uh, devices that haven't been, or that's been thrown out early. Uh, you know, we get uh, stuff from, I won't name any companies, but... <laughs> Um, that only 18 months old and it doesn't make sense to shred this sort of stuff so it's better to give that a, a second life because all the energy and time and stuff that was spent in um, creating these devices you may as well get some more use out of it and some of the stuff like pretty much everything in our office is <laughs> recycled goods we haven't bought um, many electronics um, so yeah we've got the hierarchy of disposal which we really this is, I'm preaching to the converted here, but this is what we try and promote. Um, reuse over recycling, um, which is a bit of a challenge for us with uh, some businesses. They like to have their stuff crushed, but i will get to that later. Um, so we go from reuse to re recovery. So anything that doesn't work, we send to our recovery operation, which is about 90% of what we get through. And then anything that we can't recover is disposed of um, in... WA. So there's our asset recovery operation. We're in the middle of moving both facilities together into a, a new premises, which is going to be many late nights for me. But um, yeah, here's where we can test all the equipment and wipe any data, which is a sticking point for people for reuse. Um, people worry about what they've been searching on the internet. <laughs> So we wipe all that off the data and that off the hard drive and then we can reuse uh, the devices. So just to finish it off, and this, I don't know if I've gone over the seven minutes, but um, the challenges we face recycling locally is uh, local markets for recovered products. WA doesn't really manufacture, well, doesn't manufacture much, um, so it's really hard for us to find uh, an end... Um, as like a, a home for our recycled materials, most of the stuff gets either shipped interstate or overseas where the manufacturing hubs are. Um, we also face some challenges uh, for state-based state legislation because um, waste is a state-based um, law. So we're trying to get e-waste banned from landfill in WA in South Australia and Victoria is looking at doing it. It's already been done, so um, we're trying to bring that to WA so we can lift that from 30% up to hopefully around the 70s and 80%. Um, and we've also got the challenge of an ever-changing waste stream. Just three years ago, uh, we were getting 70% of our waste came from the old CRT televisions. Now it's only about 30%. So within three years, our product that we're recycling has changed. Uh, it's, it's, al it's almost completely changed, which is a challenge for you if you're running a business. You like things to stay the same because you can set up processes to optimise that. Um, and the last sort of challenge that I'm trying to overcome is convincing businesses to allow us to reuse their good equipment because there's a lot of value there. Um, a lot of people don't need you know, the, the latest processing power that, that's out on the market. 
a lot of people just use the, inter use the computer to look at the internet or do up a few PowerPoints. So that's something that we're working to overcome through educating our customers. Um, and yeah, thanks. I'd like to invite questions now of our speakers. They've said they're open for any curly questions you might have. Any questions? Excellent. Uh, Sarita, yes. tell, tell us about um, with your subject, uh, photosynthesis 4, is it? It was something that I've heard about, and I thought that was probably something that would contribute significantly um, as an innovation. Um, is it on? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so I think you're referring actually to C4 plants rather than C3. So most of our crop plants that we grow in the temperate world are C3 plants. C4 plants are typically grown more in tropical areas, so they're things like your maize, um, sorghum, rice are C4 plants. They have the ability to be much more efficient at utilising um, carbon dioxide to produce higher yields. So it has been proposed that we, if we could develop wheat or barley to become a C4 plant, then as carbon dioxide levels increase, it would actually help us to increase yields. However, at the moment, there's lots of other things that don't work with it. So they tend to use a lot more water. Um, and carbon dioxide doesn't, isn't just increasing on its own. So you've also got increasing temp um, temperatures as well. And so it only increased to a certain level. And then when the temperature increases, it comes back down again and that. So it's there that's certainly been proposed, but there's nothing concrete coming out yet. Any questions? Yes. Question by Angus. Angus, I work in the renewable industry, thank God it's open to the people who are in biogas. I'm interested in knowing how much biogas capacity exists in your view of, around the country, because the issue of course for renewables is intermittency, and I don't believe battery storage is actually a good solution for it. How much biogas could you generate across the country based on the waste streams? Are we going? Yep, we're on. Um, uh, there's a lot out there. I mean, uh, biogas bio will come from, um, you know, biomass of any kind. In this case, it's organic going to a kind of a wet solution, but equally, there's a lot of momentum around um, pyrolysis and thermal solutions. Um, so the anything that's really, I mean, the, the waste hierarchy says we've got to recycle, reuse, etc. And f from a food waste perspective, for example, it's better that it goes to um, you know, charities, etc. And the, and the last thing that we do is that we take the waste and we put it to to extract the energy value of it. But if it's going to if it's going to landfill, um, then it's better that it goes down in this direction. The problem we have at the minute um, is that in order for technologies to be able to generate energy from any kind of biomass waste stream, it needs to be relatively clean, or it needs to be tied in, or, or clean enough for that technology to be able to deal with it. And at the moment, most waste streams, or many waste streams, other than ones that come from industry, are commingled and very, very hard to separate. So hard to separate that they're uneconomic and, and they go to landfill. So the answer to that question, I think, is there's a lot, there's a lot of waste, you know, everything that we chuck out. I think in the future there'll be, there'll be less, but uh, the trick will be, at a regional level, is to be able to aggregate that, so separate it in transfer stations, et cetera, and then push it to where it needs to go and you know, I think you'd probably agree with that, wouldn't you? That that's that's one of the, the issues that we potentially face. Although, um, yeah, I think that's sort of that would be the broad the broad answer to that. Um, if I could just add one more thing, um, in the UK, uh, where they led with a, a feed-in tariff subsidy, um, specifically around anaerobic digestion, this technology, it actually drove a marketplace where that value was actually transferred into th through the whole supply chain into the waste. So, you know, um, Britain is in a place now where it's got so many anaerobic digestion plants where they're aggregated, they're competing for waste, and in fact, rather than getting paid to take the waste, they're starting to pay to take the waste, uh, which in many ways is, is a good thing, provided the economic, economics still stack up. I suppose, um, moving on from that question, um, in your mind, do you see the the waste and the recycling programs as being a government-led thing or a private industry-led thing, especially in a small market like Perth is versus, say, the UK, where it's more developed and more players involved? Um, 
it's both. Uh, I think it's government and community. So, so in, in my view, um, business can't ignore it. Business exists to make profit, even though they'll go bot triple bottom line and corporate social responsibility. Fundamentally, it's delivering profit. So it'll go to its least cost, which means it'll, it'll cheat if it can. Business generally, I'm not talking about a business, specific business, just generally it will. So the government needs to put in those regulations and needs to internalise the cost of whatever it wants to change the behaviour of, in, in this case carbon or whatever. Um, so that's at a corporate level. But um, at a municipal level, people just need, people need education. It's a little bit like what Peter explained. Um, we, we, need, we need to reshape the way people think in the schools and everything, which is, which is happening, which is um, the way that we think about what we do with the waste and the idea that we would never ever chuck something like that in the, in, in the recycling. You know, we wouldn't put commingled waste in the recycling. You know, um, I reflect a bit being sort of of that vintage, uh, there used to be campaigns around litter and drop something sport, you know, some really effective campaigns. And I, and I recall, I recall a social, you know, you'd be a social pariah if you chuck something on the ground. You know, I almost see that, we, that hasn't been reinforced for a long time and that's actually starting, I think, to diminish. And we almost need another campaign around that. But so, to, to answer that question more specifically, I think it's a balance of both, a, a stick and education. To, to jump in there on that, the campaign about the, the no litter, yeah, it was a very, very powerful campaign. At the same time, there was a healthy eating campaign that came out, but there hasn't been another one. We don't have the same bins like you have in Japan, separating out all your litter. It's the idea of it's not being... Like, it's not the Western Australia. We're just Western Australia, yeah. So <laughs> how, how does that happen? I, I, in, in the sense of water, there was a lot of resistance to turning our sprinklers off. There still is little. How did you get there? How did that happen? Well, I think the explanation was just given. I think it's, it's a combination of regulation and changing community attitudes. But the point I was making earlier is you can't, you not, don't change community attitudes on a one-off hit. You've got to continually reinforce that. And, and over the last 20 odd years that I showed on that slide, maybe 25 years, the moment you are not in the market with the community reinforcing what you're trying to do, you get a drop off. And, and hence the number of campaigns on that last slide, slide that I had up, reinforcing, coming up with new campaigns, talking to focus groups as to what will influence people, so you re have a refresh campaign. And I think one of the problems is the expectation that you can change community attitude and it will remain changed. It's, it's unfortunately very difficult to actually get the community to change and embed that change within their psyche, if you like. Um, it just needs continual reinforcement. Now that comes from organisations, whether it's government owned or, or whoever's running that, has to redo it. I mean, you look at the road safety campaigns, they're continually trying to look at other means of convincing people to do the right things on the road. And you just have to keep doing it. We've got a lot of expertise in the audience. Uh, does anyone have any comments on that they can add? I'd just kind of like to suggest coming from an education background, A, can I ask you to finish your engineering work and do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, finished it. So, yeah, my dad was a civil and structural engineer, actually yes. worked for the Board of Works and did the Snowy that. River um, Dam. I've done a very minimal amount of research, though, and I'm finding that the educated areas, so-called, of our western suburbs are the worst in terms of education of recycling and sustainability, and I find that gobsmackingly dreadful. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think... It's, it's interesting, like, because we're pretty big on data and looking where our, where our waste is coming from, and it is interesting. The southwest has a really good um, recycling uh, rate for, for electronics. Like, they collect a lot more per capita than, say, the city does. Um, there are some star performers in councils and stuff, and I know the, the western suburbs at Shenton Park, they're one of our customers, so they do deliver e-waste um, to us, probably not as much as some other councils, but they're not the worst either. Um, Cambridge and Stirling are doing a good job. Stir Stirling's one of our biggest customers, so they're they're doing uh, mm. they're doing really well. 
Um, and it's one thing we're still trying to work out is why are some regions a lot more successful than others. It's pretty complex. Um, I guess there's, there's some, a lot of complex things going on which makes a region good at recycling versus non-existent, which some councils just don't have any program for recycling anyway. So. But our western metropolitan area, though, doesn't have a recycling. Well, you got it's, the not, it's not functional. Is yeah. that why? Well, you've got the, the limits of, I guess, the, the Balcatta Recycling Centre is pretty central and everyone can get to it. So that's one of the things to consider is they've got to have um, somewhere that's easy for people to get to. If you make them do a lot of work to recycle their um, equipment or, or anything, they just won't do it because at the end of the day, everyone's got to live their life, you know, like mm. we all, we're all here now. Mm. You don't have an hour just mm. to go and no. drive to the nearest yeah. transfer station and drop stuff off. So mm -hmm. that's one of the challenges I think local government needs to... Um, but you're uh, only about e-waste, aren't you? We just do e-waste, yes. yeah, so we're so very specific. So all the other waste, I mean, all around the world. And, uh, I mean, in 1989 I was in Queensland and they had four bins everywhere in every council that we went to, yeah. particularly in the national parks. Do you see that here? Yeah. And they do all over Europe too. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I think we've got a long way to come. A huge long way. Um, and I think, yeah, a lot of that's got to come, like like you were saying, with the regulation. Like it's got to, we've got to set targets and implement things um, as a community to make that reality. But it's got to come from government creating that space for a business to go out and and do those sorts of things. We can't enforce. No. Um, on residents to say, well, now there's 16 mm. bins, you've got to recycle everything. That that doesn't come from industry. That's got to come from... Um, it's got to come from yeah, education. Yeah, the policy People makers, don't. essentially. So. Yeah. <laughs> we have a, a question or comment at the back to come here. Yeah, just a question um, for Sarita. I think you mentioned in your presentation... Thanks, first of all, for the presentations. They were all great to listen to. Um, that China wants to be self-sufficient by 2025. Does that is that based on them acquiring land around the world to plant crops for their own population, particularly because their population is moving to the cities? So, um, yes, how does it, that, yeah, how does that it does work? include um, acquiring land around the world. So, arguably, um, that's not self-sufficient, then, is it? Like, no, I mean that's their their policy is to be self-sufficient. I didn't say they were going to be self-sufficient. Yeah, so there, it's. Um, and they're certainly quite active in buying land around a number of different places around the world. It's not just Australia. Um, Australia, actually, foreign ownership of land is only at 2%. It's a lot lower than the media would have you believe. Um, other areas like Africa um, and South America have a much higher proportion than that. I've got a question here. Leslie's been keenly waiting. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I've missed your name. Uh, James. James. Um, with the recycling, obviously there's some things that you said that you couldn't recycle and you ship them off. Could you tell me what the percentage is and where does that get shipped off to overseas in particular? Yeah, so there's not a lot that we can really do in WA. We don't have a steel manufacturing facility, so that ultimately winds up offshore um, to China. We're not a massive... Um, recycling company so we don't deal direct with smelters like things like circuit boards we do we send that to uh, Mitsubishi um, smelter in Japan so there's a lot of specialized outfits that um, have built their business on a very niche waste stream um, and they're the best at doing that so like a lot of stuff ends up back in Asia um, so a lot of the plastics go back over to China um, there's a bit of uh, a challenge facing the whole uh, recycling industry at the moment because the Chinese have changed their policies on what they'll bring in. They're trying to, uh, as they call it the iron sword, I think, and they're trying to stop um, sort of illegitimate operators and it's, uh, they're trying to make everyone go through the rigmarole of getting their licences and getting everything sorted. They're doing a lot of... Um, Good stuff over in China, actually. It's, it's quite an interesting place to visit at the moment with the, the way it's changing. Um, things that are done in Australia, we've got uh, Close the Loop that does the um, printer cartridges and things like that. They uh, are quite an innovative company that started over in um, 
the eastern states and they've spread to the US and become the, I guess, the lead recycler r around the world for printer cartridge recycling. Um, but it's just such a complex waste stream to do everything in WA is just not achievable. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit of a, bit of a challenging question because there is so many things that we recycle. But the main ones, I guess, are the metals. They'll end up back over in Asia. The circuit boards go to this Mitsubishi smelter where they're um, refined for their gold, silver, copper and, um, and palladium and things like that. Um, the glass we send to Nearstar, the leaded glass, which is um, in Port Piri, so that's in Australia. Um, they charge us a pretty, a pretty penny for that, but um, that's that they extract the, the lead out of the glass there and use that, uh, the sort of byproduct from that as a construction aggregate. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make these things. So, you know, you could turn your plastic straight back into another plastic product in Australia. At the moment, we're getting a mixed plastic stream of maybe 100 different types and compositions of plastic, and not all plastics are the same. They won't all melt together. So you've got to know exactly what you're doing to turn it back into a manufacturable product. Um, and that's sort of the challenge that we've got to overcome. Thank you. And just, just as a, a last comment on that too, is that um, you are talking about the, 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 the different city, uh, the cities and shires, et cetera, that um, have their... Um, reasons why they don't recycle, etc. I'm sure there would be a, an opportunity of sustainability research between Curtin and the year of uh, the 50 year of innovation that perhaps we could work with your company as well. Yeah, that, that'd be great. <laughs> can, I, can I just, can I ask James a quick question? Do you mind a panel to panel? Um, I was at the Mint the other day, the, the Perth Mint, and they were saying that um, because gold is so, um, so noble and so valuable um, that the up to very recently, all the gold in the world was pretty much recycled, so because it had such value, right back to the Aztecs, so the stuff we're melting down, putting in necklaces, were were from that time. But recently, it's changed. It's actually moving out of the system because it's uneconomic to recover for the first time. Is that is that is that your experience, or is that what the prevailing view would be? Well, we still get. I mean, you know, like our service, we have to charge a fee. It's not something that we can pay for um, unless it's a mixture of good assets and, and recyclable assets, we have to charge a fee because we're trying to meet a high level of recycling. If we just put it through a, a metal plant, you'd get all the good stuff, but all the leaded glass and stuff will go into landfill. So that's the challenge that we've got. People don't want to pay um, to treat things properly. Um, so I, I think I'd have to agree, but there's also the other side where you've got the extended producer responsibility schemes that are coming in which are um, basically making the brands and things that produce these things take care of uh, their products at the end of life. So they're trying to get the circular economy going. Um, so I can't see the gold being lost as such, it's just in a landfill. Someone eventually will go and pull that landfill up and mine it. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure how to answer that. There's a new mining boom coming, yeah. We've, got, we've only got a short amount of time left, so a few more questions. Hi, um, my question's for Sarita. Um, so I know that most of your research, it sounds like it's focusing on um, helping farmers, but I've heard um, some good news about uh, community-based uh, gardens where people grow crops, for example, in Singapore. Um, I just wanted to know what your opinion was on that in terms of sustainability and if you think that would be something that would be um, suitable in WA, given that even though it's been successful in a place like Singapore where land's at a premium, um, it's the opposite over here. Um, do you think they would be suitable over here in WA? Um, I think it is um, suitable, and there are a lot of, quite a few community gardens in Perth already, um, based very much around the um, British allotment system, um, which as our um, sort of land area where we live and our housing actually does become more dense, people are do have less land, and so they don't have enough room to grow you know, the tomatoes or whatever that you want to grow in your back garden. So those community gardens do become valuable. Um, they're also valuable on a community 
aspect, I think, as well, because it's a good way of getting to know your local community members rather than you know, living in your own house. But I think they, the final thing they um, in WA play a very important role is that education. And there's a huge divide between the urban and the rural areas in terms of where our food comes from. And so although community gardens in Perth will never feed the world, they won't feed Perth, um, that education is so important in understanding where our food comes from and what farmers are going through in order to produce it, rather than just you know, accepting where it comes from in the supermarket and not being aware of that, that whole chain of how it gets there. And just to add into that, the work going on in my school of built environment is that community gardens and other green spaces are critical for breaking apart the, the urban heat sink that develops as we become increasingly um, sort of um, higher density. And in Perth in the last sort of incensal period, the last five years, we had uh, 40,000 more households move into townhouses in the inner city area. There's massive change occurring. So this is, this is having another effect as well in the, in the sustainability realm. Oh, uh, uh, my question's for Peter. Um, you mentioned um, as we've gone through and started to build desal plants, the, the demand seems to be actually outstripping our expectations of um, the amount of desal um, capacity that we need. Is there a view on the long-term composition of desal water to the Perth um, per supply and also, do you see the, the cost of that technology um, dropping or, or um, improving efficiency as fast as some of the other renewable technologies? Um, what I was really talking about was the, the lack of other source water from rain that's driving the need for additional desal as much as population growth. But as we go forward, um, we will be continuing to focus on demand management, but at some point in time, future sources are going to be required. And at this stage, living in Perth, the potentiality is it's going to be desal. Um, limited, I mean, you would use as much reuse as you can through groundwater replenishment and other things, but, but ultimately, um, that only recycles a percentage of the water that's been used anyway, and, and you'll uh, use the efficiencies of that. Bearing in mind that a groundwater replenishment is the same technology as seawater desalination with membranes that need less pressure to push the water through. So it's a, you're actually looking at the same plant. The answer is yes, desal will become a component in the longer term. The efficiency is the desal plants. Um, before we built the first desal plant, uh, the efficiencies took a, a huge leap forward. They went from, <coughs> excuse me, about um, 10 kilowatt hours per cubic metre of production down to currently today about 3.4 and that's what's made it viable today. Um, to improve that, two, one of two things are going to happen. I don't think you're going to get much more efficient in energy recovery. They're up at about 98% uh, now. But you will potentially get membranes that will be more efficient and improve the, the cost there. I think it's going to be at the margins unless there is a major breakthrough somewhere in that, that whole cycle. Um, but, I mean, desal at the moment, gate prices are around $2 a cubic metre, um, which is reasonable price. The problem that we really face is where are you going to put the desal plants and how, what's the cost of the infrastructure to get it from there back into the system? Because despite the fact that we've got a fabulous coastline, it happens to be embedded with lots of reefs and other things that are environmentally sensitive and finding a, an appropriate location for desal is somewhat more difficult than, uh, than you would otherwise think with the coastline we have. 